Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Environmental Social Justice. Today, we have a bit of a celebrity with us. We have the founder and president of Altice, Mr. Terry Taminen. So welcome to the show, Terry. Thank you. Hey, Terry. And I have to do a little bit of fangirling for Terry's bio. So bear with me because Terry has had so many accomplishments in life. It's a very long introduction. So you have lived and worked around the world. You were appointed by Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'm a huge fan of his, um, to the Secretary of the California Environmental Protection Agency. Then you were the Cabinet Secretary and the Chief Policy Advisor for the Governor. Um, you made many groundbreaking sustainability policies, including California's landmark Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006, the Hydrogen Highway, huge fan of hydrogen, and the Million Solar Roofs Initiative. So Terry, first question, how did you even come down this road when no one was really doing what you were doing? You know, it started uh, when I was a kid. My parents got me a diving certification course uh, when I was 12 years old. I went diving off of Palos Verdes here in Los Angeles and just was mesmerized by the kelp forest and the hundreds of species that live in it and, and just the amazing undersea world. And then my family moved to Australia. I came back 10 years later to go to college. I went diving in that same spot and everything was gone. Everything was covered in polluted sediment. And at that moment, I knew that something was wrong and it was being caused by humans. And I spent much of the next part of my career in real estate and doing other things, but finally decided to start a nonprofit to fight pollution and to restore the bay. And that led me to lots of other bays. And parts of the world that I thought I could help restore. Yeah. Utterly fantastic. I mean, again, when, um, you know, Joel had actually brought this up before we went live. No, you started doing this when it wasn't the cool hip thing to do. So that was an uphill battle to say the very least. Um, and then just all the success after success after success that you have had and ultimately leading you to Alta Sea, which is, um, so it's an ocean related solutions. Um, could you tell us about the fact that it's a public private ocean institute and explain what that means? Sure, so the public part is that we're a nonprofit and we're in the port of Los Angeles. The port has dedicated a 35 acre campus that right now has 100 year old historic warehouses on it, hundreds of thousands of square feet of these historic warehouses. And we're raising the funds to restore those into a modern facility where researchers can come and learn more about the ocean, develop solutions from the ocean to our climate challenges and our environmental challenges. Uh, students can study along the way. And then, of course, companies will get spun out of this. The discoveries that we make, we can find new ways of producing food and fuel, pharmaceuticals, uh, industrial products, energy, clean energy from the ocean. And another area that we focus on is underwater robotics and sensors so that we can understand our planet and our future even better. Uh, you know, you, you touched on so many different things. So I want to take it piece by piece, if that's OK. Um, one of the things you touched with education and business and technology, a lot of people are don't really put that synergy together of science, business, education. So why is that particular collaboration so important? Stop and think about 50 years ago in Silicon Valley, uh, Stanford and UC Berkeley and other institutions were minting graduates like the Hewlett's and the Packard's and the Steve Jobs. And they went off to their garages and they built computers and they built products. So the education was critical to understand the science and the technology in order for their brains to come up with these products that make our lives, well, let's say hopefully better. I don't know about being stuck on our iPhones all day long, but, but <laughs> yes, generally speaking, makes it better. And so it's the same thing here. We've got, uh, we've got these wonderful institutions, UCLA, USC, community colleges, um, career tech colleges, others that are educating the next generation of these kinds of innovators, but in solutions in blue economy and blue technology rather than just information technology. Oh, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that um, I love about this upcoming generation is they are paying attention to climate change, sustainability, and not consuming as much. Whereas for the past 30, 40 years, it was all about how much money can I make? How much can I consume? How much can I take? And I think we're now reaching that tipping point where we're, we're kind of in a dire situation to fix that. 
And I see the students nowadays are paying closer attention. And um, one of the things you talked about was um, we are running out of agricultural space. We are, you know, the farms we have are kind of, the commercial farms are not great. They strip the soil. So you were doing something called aquaculture. And I don't think many people would know what that is or why that's important. It's important for some of the reasons you just mentioned, which is that because of climate uh, change, some farmlands are experiencing uh, severe droughts or floods and heavy storms that then wipe out crops. So we're losing cropland. As you mentioned, we're also depleting the soil. We're mm -hmm. covering it with uh, fossil based uh, fossil fuel fertilizers and pesticides and chemicals which run off into our water that we're ingesting. So it's not sustainable. And then, of course, with uh, 7 billion people on the path to 10 billion by mid-century, we need a lot more food. And land is, is very scarce. We're already stripping rainforests in Brazil to grow soy, to feed the cattle, to make a hamburger and things like that. So the ocean is a place where we can do this much more sustainably, both uh, from on land in tanks with things like fish or, or shrimp or other kinds of seafood, but also in large aqua farms. We have a 100 acre demonstration farm about six miles offshore from Altasea in the port of Los Angeles, where researchers and companies are uh, growing things like mussels and oysters on ropes. And then the, the boat comes out, picks up the rope, strips the oysters and the mussels off of it, reseeds it, puts it right back in. So it's industrial farming, but uh, out in the middle of the ocean, taking advantage of the fact that all the nutrients, all of the energy that's needed to produce that food is right there given to us by nature. If we just put the ropes in the water with the right kinds of seeds on them, that uh, we can do that. We can also grow kelp and other kinds of seaweed, which normally would grow in shallow water inshore, instead of decimating our coastal resources and wetlands, we can do that in those aqua farms, also on large ropes, so endless amounts. And uh, uh, one of the groups that's uh, researching at Alta Sea today, the University of Southern California Kelp Lab, is looking at different kinds of kelp that grow faster or that produce more oil or more protein depending on what it is you're trying to grow and then demonstrating it at this aqua farm. So we're going to generate a, a future of farmers, but they'll be going to work in a boat instead of a tractor. You know, Terry, we were working, we, we, we had a, an interview uh, last week on this very subject with the Beverly Hills farm, um, yes. which uh, is growing food hydroponically, uh, lots of vegetables, uh, so that we are not using so much soil, so much soil runoff. Uh, we're keeping the integrity of vegetables and fruits, which has been really hard recently. Even if you look in the grocery store these days, fruits and vegetables just don't look as fresh as they prior they did prior. So it's really important that you know we're we're figuring out different ways to get our food sources hydroponically yep. with water uh, with less soil. Um, and as a water professional, that just means the world to me, um, seeing that we can actually make a difference and make a shift, but even have cleaner and healthier food as well. And I, th I think what's going on with what you're putting together, uh, the public-private partnerships, as an, a trained economist, this is really, really important to me. You know, we talk about, even when I worked at the legislature, we talk uh, all of the time about creating public-private partnerships, but either the political side doesn't quite understand how a company can be profitable in, in such a way, or the private side just cannot afford to wait for uh, the political side to kick in. So can you talk a little bit more about how in sustainability uh, public-private partnerships uh, can really come into play and how you're doing it successfully and how other companies can kind of follow with this eco-trend of public-private partnerships? Sure. I, and I just want to comment on your point about, uh, about indoor farming. Not only does it have all those benefits you mentioned, but it puts the food production closer to where it's going to be consumed. Yes. When you put a plate of food on your table tonight, look, take a look at it. The average distance that that food traveled to get to your plate is 1,300 miles. Think wow. about how much uh, fossil fuel it took to deliver that product. Now, of course, some things are more local, some are more distant, but 
in part because we always seem to want to have all of our fruits and vegetables, even if they're not in season, we want them in our in our stores and at, uh, on our shelves. So to do that, it means we're getting we're importing a lot from great distances. So we can really cut down pollution and, and particularly climate uh, impacts by sourcing things more locally like that. And it's great for small entrepreneurs, even mom and pop businesses, because you can produce a lot of food, even in a the size of a shipping container with that's uh, what they're doing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So so that's really exciting. And so to answer your question about public private partnerships, I think the piece that's missing because you're right. It, public and the private don't always see eye to eye is an intermediary like all to see where we get in the middle and we say, OK, look, we're a nonprofit. So we're going to take funding from philanthropic sources, but also from government. We're going to use uh, this property that the Port of Los Angeles, which is a government agency, has provided us as long as we perform this nonprofit service. And then we're going to invite the companies. We're going to help them understand how to work with the researchers and then how to take their their discoveries and commercialize those and give them a showcase to do it, help them find private funding and investors and so forth. So I think the answer is it takes the, the kind of intermediary in between to bring the parties together. Yeah. It's kind of funny. I mean, listening to all this, it seems like, I don't know, maybe it's just the way I'm interpreting it, but it's almost like we're using technology to correct the damage that technology did. And I find that to be very fascinating to look at it, you know, whether it's combating the pesticides to try to do more of an organic thing, or, you know, we do the supply chains because we think we can do a global thing, but now we're like realizing, mm, hold up, wait a minute, maybe we don't need to do that. Maybe we don't need to have you know, like you said, out of season, during season, you know, and all this kind of stuff. So I think that's actually really fascinating to look at it as like an overhead thing about that. I think that's, that's really cool. cool. That's a great point. And of course, when the machines take over with Skynet, oh, wait a minute. No, that's a <laughs> What do you mean when? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But no, I think well, that's really cool. Bring Arnold back. <laughs> because we don't really look at some of the damage that, you know, we're looking at trying to correct things and change the way that we are as a, but I love that you're looking at it. It seems like to just say like, oh, you know, these technological advances created this. So now we need to use our current technology to correct that. I mean, is that something that you've always been focused on or interested in? Or I mean, you know, I, I would say, especially since working with Arnold, because he's pointed this out that, you know, it, it's uh, technology isn't just the perfect answer. We have to stop and think about nature based solutions and and so forth. But a technology, first of all, is one of the better ways we can understand what's going on and that damage that we were doing unintentionally. I mean, when the first uh, oil bubbled up through the ground and we said, gee, what could we do with this? Nobody imagined climate change. And, you know, sure, oil uh, became this massive industrial revolution that helped humanity to get to where it is today. But as you said, also painted us into this corner. So, you know, Arnold is the one that says, look, it's, for example, when he was running for governor and he was criticized for being the guy that popularized the Hummer, uh, we converted a Hummer to run on hydrogen, uh, clean hydrogen in a fuel cell so that it was an electric Hummer. And now they're selling electric Hummers on the Super Bowl uh, commercials. And again, even that, you know, you don't want to buy a Hummer if it's just you and you're driving to the store to get a quart of milk. Uh, it's still wasteful. But the point is, some people need a larger vehicle for business or because they've got, you know, several kids. Families, yeah. 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 So it's not the vehicle. It is the technology, to your point, Joel. It's it's uh, now using technology to help us out of that painted corner. Yeah. yeah. It's fascinating to me. Although I will say selling the Hummer for $120,000, $150,000, eh, that's another issue to talk about. Well, right. That's uh, wealth inequality and so forth is another topic. Yes. Yes. And we also talk, we, of, we often talk about affordability of electric vehicles, hydrogen vehicles, and it's coming. The technology is getting better. It is coming. So sit tight. Um, but since we're on tech, we're, I'm going to geek out a little bit. Could you please tell us about the blue tech and robotics that you guys have? Because it is true. We only know about 5% of our ocean floors. For sure. And one of our tenants at uh, Alta Sea is Bob Ballard, who found the Titanic, amongst other great discoveries. He keeps his vessel, the Nautilus, there when it's in port and does all of his outfitting there and so forth. And he has a big robotics lab there where they design and, and test the robots that they're going to use for their exploration and their sensors and their side scan sonars and things like that. And then he brings in uh, or we bring in for him 
high school students who build robots with him and then they test it right off our pier. Some of them sink to the bottom and are never seen again. Others, <laughs> others are innovation, which even he can use on his next voyage. And right now he's actually out in the Pacific. To your point, Wendy, he's mapping for the U.S. government. He's mapping vast areas of the ocean that have never been mapped before. And yes. so that at some point we'll end up with an atlas of, of our whole planet. Yeah, one of my former professors, um, he would spend a few months every year in the middle of the Pacific mapping and, you know, my background's geology. So he was an oceanographer. And I mean, just going out in that part of the Pacific is very dangerous. So more power to them for doing that. And with this robotics lab and all to see in the port of Long Beach, um, are there field trips allowed? Can you go visit? Absolutely. We welcome the public. In fact, on April 23rd, we have our next open house um, from 10 to 1. That's a Saturday, obviously related to Earth Day. Uh, every other month we have another one. So if you just go to our website, which is altasea.org, so A-L-T-A-S-E-A dot O-R-G, altasea.org, uh, you can find our events calendar and we have lots of open houses and we're always welcoming people. I will say right now we're under construction. We're renovating those hundred year old warehouses, which by the way, one of the first uses was by the Navy as a submarine base in World War I. I didn't, speaking of tech, I didn't even know we had submarines in World War I. I didn't uh, hear. Then they took it over again in World War II. And I think my dad may have gone through there. He's no longer with us to ask, but he was a Marine who trained in California and shipped out to the Pacific. So would have gone through Los Angeles and probably pass through those historic warehouses. So we're currently renovating them. So uh, when you do come by, wear a hard hat, but- uh, <laughs> I have a few. <laughs> there's a lot to see and we do invite the public. Oh, I, I'm actually gonna take you up on that because I'm fascinated, especially with renovations and history. And again, submarines in World War One, I, I had no clue. Um, I don't know how that would, how they'd be able to even have that technology without what we have today. That's pretty phenomenal to me. Um, so on that, I will um, let people know to find Altacy, visit Altacy, donate if you can. They have plenty of partnerships, but every little bit helps. That's our tagline. Help these guys grow to be bigger and education, business, and the environment should all always be hand in hand. So I thank you guys for that. Um, we will see you next time and uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you. As somebody once said, I'll be back. Oh. <laughs> You know I love Arnold. I got it. You got to get that out there. Okay, guys, take care. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Bye now.